is uh, testing in large sessions. Uh, I'll introduce myself, let my colleagues introduce themselves, and we'll get rolling. I've got the boring stuff, so I'll lead off so they can get the exciting stuff later. I'm Lou Slimak, Director of Assessment, uh, Provost's Office. I get all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, <laughs> had academic integrity a while before Azalea Holbert was uh, hired to be Director of Academic Integrity, and I've been working on testing in large sections with John Campbell and a couple of other departments. To my left. Uh, my name is Paul Miller. I'm a uh, teaching associate professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. John Navaratnam in biology. I'm a teaching assistant professor. And so, yeah, here's the like, kind of like base boring stuff. Um, the Provost's Office, Everly College's math and chemistry departments, and really Everly College in general, have started kind of partnering on some large-scale process agreements. Um, there were some large collusive events a couple of years ago that involved 15, 20 students cheating at a time in testing sections, uh, primarily math and chemistry, that, that were um, alarming, that kind of started off the whole cascade of better reporting, more data, Azalea's position, understanding what's going on at the institution. And so Everly, on its own, began to do some things to try and counter those problems. Um, and one of the things it did was create common evening exam times so that everyone in a Chem 116 class tests on Tuesday night and everyone has that same test time. Um, but the problem with that is you're just gathering everybody together and letting them test at the same time. That doesn't really change the problem or address the problem. So what we did this year um, was to take all 18 large downtown classrooms that are used in this common testing uh, and label the seats. Uh, facilities uh, did that, they went through, they gave them all a label. We went then through and created a room diagram for each, and I can <coughs> show you what the website is there for that and what that looks like. Maybe. If I didn't kill the computer. And then they're available in PDF files as well as um, kind of like big concert hall posters outside each room. So if you walk by any of these now, there's these big white paper boards out in front of each room that have got the seating diagrams. Um, so that we could assign seats. You can't assign seats if you don't know what the seats are. And we were surprised by <laughs> how little there actually was on, there we go, on these. And, and when we, <laughs> as a humorous aside, when we started looking at them, there were quite a few that had rows skipped things numbered backwards or upside down or sideways or like 10 repeated three times. So we had to go through and fix all those things. I'm not sure who numbered them the first time, um, but that was an education. And then for each room, we've got these, yeah, yeah, these kinds of things. Again, this is available as a PDF, so if you want to give to your students, the people in math and chemistry using them are giving them to their students to say, hey, you've been assigned seat C6, see the room diagram, this is where it's at. You've got then these outside the room. So again, if I've got C6 and I come to the day or the class, I can see where I sit. Um, if you actually, you know, it's hard to see from here, but there are darker seats and there are lighter seats. So the darker seats are left-handed seats. One of the very first things we also realized in these diagrams is we didn't account for lefties. Uh, so we've accounted for lefties in all these diagrams. We accounted for accommodations and left accommodation space. But all these things, again, just to kind of support helping assign seats. Once you, assign, once you have all these things labeled, then what we did is we, we asked Math and Chem to give all of, our, all of their students to us, so by uh, ID. So who's all your Chem 115 students in what section by what ID? And we assigned all the students to a seat. Um, that was department and course dependent. Math wanted everyone organized <coughs> across sections. So regardless of, mix everybody together. Take all the math whatevers, lump them into one group, split them across all the testing rooms so that you'd be sitting across people you've never seen before. Some of chemistry was like that and then some of chemistry was like, well no, we want all of my 116 students, we want them randomized. So um, it wasn't that it had to be done a particular way. You, you let us tell you know, how we wanted to organize them. We created a photo roster. Um, and the photo rosters to help faculty and student proctors identify cheaters, and to do so without being disruptive, right? One of the hardest things to do in a large class when you're testing, if you've got 150 people and you know, notice like guy, middle row, cheating. Hey guy, cheating, middle row, stop, come down here. I need to talk to you, who are you? What's your name? I need to write this down. 
None of that is productive for the testing environment. That doesn't help you actually stop and catch the person. Uh, what this is, and this has resulted in a couple, this one is now Proctor saying, you know, no, it was this person. They verify the identity with the person, the photo ID. They're able to put that down. They get a second Proctor to say, yeah, it was that person. And that's, that's the report. Nothing has to happen. The testing environment isn't disrupted. There's a report been made. We've also seen people then use IDs that aren't them, right? Which was, we knew was happening, but it's hard to catch. Um, when the students come in, they're being checked, but then when they sit down, sometimes they're sitting in different places. And it's like, oh, is that a mistake? And then when people run out of the room, it's probably not a mistake. It's because they were there to take a test for somebody. Um, so a piece that we've generated to help proctors and faculty um, navigate those rooms. We worked with those departments to change their expectations of what they needed to provide. Uh, math and Chem didn't have many proctors per exam room. They had, so we have asked them to provide one lead faculty per room. So when you're testing in a room, there's a lead faculty member. One proctor dedicated to handing out and collecting tests so that someone is just managing the, the mess and logistics of the test itself. And then one proctor for 50 students. Um, prior to this semester, at least some of the courses had one proctor per 200, 300 students. You're not proctoring at that point, right? You're just managing the mess. Um, if you've got 300 tests and tests are always coming in, you're not proctoring. You're just, and again, not, not your fault. You can't. So we've asked them to, to boost that up. We helped find them extra proctors, um, provide sign-up sheets, did all that good stuff. And then we had to train their proctors on identifying and reporting academic dishonesty. If you've got a bunch of undergraduate or even graduate proctors, they need to know what they do and don't want to do. Again, you don't want them confronting students. I don't want faculty confronting students in this day and age. Right? That scares the death out of me is I don't know what's going to happen. Um, your word's good enough. That was kind of the main message that we wanted to pass along to proctors. If you see something, and particularly if there are multiple proctors in the room and another proctor sees something, that's all you need to proceed for with an academic dishonesty hearing, right? We're not going to throw them out of the university where you're going to need hard pulled evidence. We're just going to say, hey, you were doing something. Two of you seeing the same behavior is enough. And having that kind of training um, for the proctors and faculty was helpful. Lou, where did you find supply of proctors for these chemistry exams? Uh, chem was tight. They didn't quite have enough. Well, really what they did is they went back to their students and asked them to do more than they were used to doing. Um, they were used to only doing one or two a semester, and they just kind of went back to them and said, no, nah, you know, we, this is important. And they went back to their TAs in particular and said, you know, part of your TA ship is understanding why this is important and have packaged it really as professional development, honestly. Be like, you know, this is something that you're going to encounter as faculty. You're going to have to deal with. Think of this as... Um, understanding that better. So they, they didn't get more people, although we had, we had briefly talked about it, they just upped their expectations of their students. And then, and then we sent a letter, this is the last bit of my yapping, a letter to all math and chem students about the new expectations for them, and that any of these, breaking any of these constitutes academic dishonesty. And then this is just a kind of a fast bullet point of that letter. But you had to have an ID and get matched to your seat. You check in, right? You're not just walking in, sitting down. You're walking in, giving an ID to someone. They're checking you against your seat. They are in your seat. No electronic devices on your person at all. Like, they're not in your pocket. Unless you have got an accessibility service uh, release to have something for medical reasons, you're not allowed to have anything on you. Um, again, even if you're not using it, having it on you is not okay. We, don't, we can't tell what your hands are doing. Did I just seriously delete that? That was amazing. I think that's... Yeah. Keep your desk clean, keep your hands on it. You know, if your desk got something else on it that shouldn't, that's not okay. If your hands are down playing beneath your desk, that's not okay. You know, if some of these like, <laughs> if you're like kindergarten, no talking. Keep your eyes on your own paper. Uh, it's amazing that you have to say this, but we, and again, we did so that you could have the baseline set. Um, no leaving and returning to the exam. You can't stop once, have someone from going to the bathroom. Like, they, they can go to the bathroom, they can't come back. Right? That's fine. <laughs> Go to the bathroom before you start the exam. You're not coming back after that. And then the last bullet, or the second to last bullet, excuse me, or the last two bullets are something that we've encouraged more. Um, don't leave during the last 15 minutes. What was happening, particularly in these big rooms, was everyone then finishes ish in the last 15 minutes, and then all hell could be breaking loose, right? Because you can't possibly watch. Well, look, you can leave early if you finish early. Come down one by one and turn your exam in. Once it hits that last 15 minutes, Everyone will now collect their exams at one point in time so that the room can be managed, so that you're not dealing with that chaos. Um, and then we've just added a bullet that's not really an expectation or requirement, but a heads up 
knowledge checks may be required, may be requested or conducted after this. And all a knowledge check is is, hey, you bombed your first test, you got a 20. Hey, you bombed your second exam, you got a 20. Hey, exam three, you got a 97. You want to come in and just take some, show me what you're doing, show me some problems, right? The idea of a knowledge check isn't that you, you're, not, you're not accusing them of anything, right? You're actually letting them defend their grade. Come in, prove to me that you have improved this much, right? That's okay. Um, and then go from there. And we're working on a policy to actually turn those into um, guidelines for how you would then proceed with charges. Uh, if they fail a knowledge check and I want to have cleaner guidelines. But again, just letting students know that may happen. So that's kind of, again, the, I didn't want to talk long. I didn't. That's amazing. That never happened. You all are lucky. <laughs> uh, that's kind of the baseline stuff we've been doing with Everly. Uh, I will turn it over to, to John and Paul to talk about what they do, and then we'll field questions as you have them. Go ahead, Paul. All right. Uh, let's see. I have a couple of pictures as well. They can, you can slap me. It'll come back up in a sec. Uh, so I will say, first I'll say thanks to, to Lou and, and everybody that's been part of this process of bringing this up and fixing it and, and thinking about it on the, on the college level because I think that most of us that have been around for a while had struggled with this uh, by department or by instructor or whatever uh, without clear guidance as to what we could or could not do and what constituted evidence and all this kind of stuff. So. Um, my basic strategy in Physics 111 uh, is based on our particular concerns, but let me say that first we're a little bit lucky in physics. Uh, I, I oversee the Physics 111 half, which is basically first semester physics primarily for engineering students. It's calculus-based physics. Uh, and we're lucky because, number one, we have 300 to 500 students in a semester instead of the larger numbers of chemistry or math. Uh, and number two, we have uh, student, graduate student TAs that essentially hand grade uh, all of our exams so that we can construct a situation where we don't have to do Scantron type things and that sort of, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but let me just say that our basics, uh, well also as, as preface, let me say that we have in physics in these classes been doing common exams since the fall of 2015. Um, and we've traditionally been Monday nights for as far back as, as anybody can remember. So um, we've made some changes and modifications based on what, what's happened in Eberly, but a, a lot of what we do is, is basically our own, our own design. So I would say that the first ingredient that we have in, in this is we set the expectation what the student should learn. You know, these are what we expect you to learn, this is what we expect you to be able to do uh, at the end of this course or by the time you get to this exam. We have a fairly, a fairly specific list of outcomes. Understand these ideas, be able to do these types of problems, uh, and so forth. Uh, and then we also uh, try very hard to um, complement the teaching of the topic uh, the teaching of physics with the idea of this is how you learn physics. This is what it means to think like a physicist. Uh, this is the general idea. This is how you apply the general idea. This is how you double check to see that your answer makes sense. Uh, these kinds of skills and techniques are, are important. So emphasizing that approach I is important. Um, I have traditionally acknowledged directly to students that we know that answers to homework questions and things like that uh, are available online, that, that any published textbook at any level of undergraduate physics, basically, even up to graduate physics, uh, is now available online. Uh, but that if they want to do this, that is not uh, a useful thing, that they need to think of that um, as self-punishing behavior if you go online and, and just look the thing up. 15% of their grade in our class is, is homework, and so they can get that perfectly by doing it online and not getting caught. Uh, but 65% is being able to sit there in the test and get the answer right. So they ultimately are practicing for the exam on their, on their homework, and, and we emphasize that there's a responsible and, and smart way to do that. Um, in my notes, I, I, I will say that that's, uh, well, I, I, have, I wrote down here the same thing that Lou said, which is we want 
the instructors for sure and the TAs also to avoid confrontational situations, uh, that that's not what we want. We don't want to create, we don't want to envision this whole problem as one of a sort of an arms race of they use a, a different technology and then we have to, you know, do something else. Um, you know, or else we're, we're building giant copper cages in which to <laughs> test or something, you know. Uh, and that's, that's not, I, I think that's not the approach. I think the approach is to awesome explain, problem. yeah, it would be, it would be. <laughs> Take them all to the green bank and sit them in the <laughs> copper box. Um, but the idea here is, you know, convince them that, look, you can, maybe you can get away with it here in this foundational course, but that might just delay your failing out of engineering school, you know, when you get to dynamics or something, and you failed just the same, but you've got another year of student loan debt or whatever, you know, let's try to think about this uh, intelligently. My job is not to be their friend. My job is to uh, give them the, the skills and tools and practice and schedule that they need in order to be successful in the content that we want them to be successful in. And then ultimately my goal is to see them uh, in some photograph that comes across on their graduation day uh, that, you know, that I know they're off there being successful. Uh, so with all that in mind, uh, the last thing that we do is we try very hard to make it difficult to cheat, right? We want to make it really inconvenient to cheat as well. So let me, let me go over to the slide thing here. Let's see if I can break this out of here. Does this work? Straight up. All right. So I just have a couple of pictures here. So let's do that. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So this is what I was just saying, waiting for the, the screen to come up. Uh, so all this stuff is what I said. Uh, in terms of exam administration, um, we have identified a couple of simple software tricks that we can use. So the textbook that we've used for years and years is a giant Pearson textbook. We use some of their multiple choice questions. That comes with this little kind of instructor test bank software that's really clunky and relatively terrible. Um, but one thing that it does do is it allows you to create some questions. You can write your own if you want. And then it will scramble them. It will put them in different order and it will scramble the answers in different order. So for years, we've just made our questions that we want and then made different versions of them. Uh, and then uh, sort of three quarters of our test is free response problems. Uh, we have four of these of which the top three, the, the students' best three count. And we make different versions of this. If they're numerical problems where they're calculating an answer, we can use a spreadsheet to come up with two different combinations of numbers that will give you a visually and qualitatively different answer uh, that is of the same sort of, let's say, sophistication or whatever. We try very hard not to make one answer seven and the other answer a non-terminating fraction. <laughs> you know, we want them both to be sort of equally mathematically um, complicated. Uh, but we also change things like it, it may say draw the graph for a positive acceleration car. And then on the other version, it will say, you know, the word positive will be changed to negative so that if they glance over and they see a particular quality to the graph on the test beside them, copying that will give them the wrong answer. Uh, and then we use the photocopier to combine these uh, relatively simply into uh, eight different, you know, eight different versions uh, that are in different colors and whatnot. And the 8 was not chosen because 8's a big number necessarily, but the 8 was chosen because we have historically had in these classes 8 TAs. And so making 8 combinations gives each TA a thing to grade that they can carry out of there. And if you use the photocopier to do it, then each TA has whatever, 50 in their pile. It sort of evens out the piles for the TA. Uh, new this year, this fall, we've added seat randomization, uh, which I chose to do myself. Um, and it's worked out well. I think it's been a, a, a benefit. Uh, and then we use our cover page for the exam, which I have some copies of here, if you want to pass it around. I'll highlight it a little bit. But the cover page we use just as a way to reinforce <coughs> expectations and to uh, sort of leverage the students to assist with exam management. And I'll show that in a second. 
Uh, part of that is when we first get our final roster after the drop ad deadline, we just take every section in order and we give the students a number. So each student has a thing we call their physics number. We assign that to them and put that in eCampus and they're asked to know it. Um, and then other stuff is, you know, know your instructor, know your lab TA, know your lab time, and those kinds of things. Uh, the common exams happen, they fill this stuff out, and then we use that cover sheet to sort the exams. So they're sorted in four different ways based on that data on that cover sheet. As it's turned in, it's sorted by exam type into eight piles. We have four different multiple choice things that are two different colors typically, so the TAs will just make eight piles to bring back for grading. And then after they're graded, they go into eCampus. They're sorted by physics number, so they're easy to put into there by the instructor. Uh, and then once they're put in, they get resorted again by lab TA because they'll be returned uh, in the lab with a process to looking at the key and appealing, which is also handled very carefully to make sure they're not writing on it after it's been administered. Um, we have a, a fairly specific procedure for that. And then uh, whatever doesn't get handed out, whatever's orphaned or appealed gets back to the instructor uh, by, by, that, by that sorting. So the current cover page looks sort of like this. This is the top half of it. Um, and this is, if you, you might recognize, this is just a LaTeX thing that we you know, run over and over again and make little changes to. to, to uh, so it looks like a complicated layout, but really once you get it in LaTeX, it's, it's easy to fix. Um, we give them uh, a place at the top to write their name and the little box to write their physics number and there's a little thing up there that says getting all this data right is two points and when we started doing that all of a sudden their data was right <laughs> you know they will do anything for two points it's the strangest thing uh, but you know what day of the week is lab what time what you know which room uh, and so forth uh, and and so they, they fill that out, and the TAs tend to double check that as, as it goes in. And then, let's see, these are the highlights. The second little line here is, in little tiny print under where they write their name, there's a tiny reminder that we've had there for years and years that says, <coughs> by writing my name here, I promise to follow the student code of conduct. I like John's version better when we saw it the other day. I'll probably update this to match more of what John's doing. Uh, and then this and this and so forth. The second part of it, the bottom part of it, has what we have developed over time as uh, our rules. So that this is on every exam, every time. This is posted in their practice exam folder all semester prior to the first exam so that they can see what's going on. And these have become, you know, these have evolved over time, but this is the current version. And it looks a little bit like what, what we've heard from, from, from Lou's presentation. Um, but we will still get people that will, you know, say, they will appeal their answer and they will say, but my answer is correct. It's only a tiny bit off from the one that's on the key that's the right answer, but their answer will just be an answer with no, no work or anything, right? I emphasize over and over again that your job as a physics student is not to find the answer. Your job is to show us that you understand what's going on. So, you know, you don't get full credit for having guessed the right answer or for having come up with it in your calculator correctly, what you get full credit for is justifying the thinking behind your answer. What are the relevant ideas and how do you use those to get to this particular thing? Um, and we've also gone back and forth over the years between what kind of calculator they're allowed and things like that. Uh, these exams are not, we, we do not and haven't for many years allowed the traditional physics equation page. Um, I have taken the opposite approach of you will not be allowed an equation page of any sort and in sort of in recognition of that we write the problems to be very basic and very you know there are no like trick questions and weird questions or whatever it's can you figure out a block on an incline with friction and this and that you know whatever it's uh, it's very very basic so if you've got f equals ma you don't need a you know, an equation sheet for F equals MA. I joke that they, if they want, they can have a tattoo. They, they can have it tattooed. <laughs> no rules against tattoos. Uh, but uh, that's the basic approach. And then 
the multiple version thing, this is just a picture of one of the pages. So typically on the bottom of the second page as it comes out of the photocopier. So here's an example of the exam. The second exam on the bottom of the second page, typically on each different version, just to keep ourselves sane, there'll be a little, a little icon that we've stuck on there with an ink stamp. So I'm a former high school teacher, and so I have a drawer full of stamps, like, like any good educator. Uh, so I, you know, I put the birthday cake on in September because it's close to my birthday, and then there's usually a sun and a, you know, whatever. Just a few little pictures to help them sort. And that's basically been our way. Now what, what we've found with this is that it tends to be pretty obvious if they copy, uh, like if we see a yellow, you know, the yellow exam answer neatly reproduced on a white exam, that's relatively, we've seen that more than, I wouldn't say we've seen that a lot, but we see that a couple times a year. Um, and we would just null the grade and, and move on. Um, it helps us now to know that that's something that we have a mechanism for reporting and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, I would say that when we have found that, let's say, several years ago, um, <coughs> when we did report that sort of thing, there was, uh, you know, the, the feedback that we got was sort of, can you, can you prove this? You know, there was a lot of photocopying and all this sort of stuff. So I appreciate the new uh, idea that we can just report things of, of any size uh, and, and the idea that, we, that seeing it or being suspicious of it is enough. I think that's very helpful. But anyway, I will, I will stop there uh, and turn it over to John. I had a question before you do. You were talking about the homework. Um, do you give formative feedback on the homework? Uh, so we, like most physics departments, don't, well, so I, I'll speak for 111. In 112, they do do paper homework, and they do give some formative uh -huh. feedback. Um, in 111, we don't. We, okay. use, we use, you know, mechanized computerized homework systems. But they know if they've got it wrong or right? Or they know quickly if they've got okay. it wrong or right. It's scored. Okay. Um, it's, we don't have a lot of information about how they did it. OK. Um, we, we have not a lot of choice there other than to put it on them mm -hmm. to practice their problem solving well. Right? And then we provide other stuff that's not homework, practice exams and review sheets and things like that. <laughs> oh, what's the right answer? Uh, when the block accelerates upward, uh, the tension is greater than the weight. In other words, I got it wrong. The only time, the only time your tension and your weight are going to be the same is when you're at, you know, just well at constant speed. I guess you could say. Think about it as standing on a bathroom scale. The bathroom scale is going to change if you're accelerating. It's going to not change if you're not. Okay, John? So I don't have much more to add except that biology does something very similar to what Paul does with his testing system. Um, we do not, in biology, use the common exam approach. You can imagine if math, chemistry, physics, and then biology does these evening exams, these students will not have a life, right, <laughs> outside their class times during regular hours. So. Um, I think the reason we didn't choose to do that is because, and I'm probably going to jinx myself by saying this, but we haven't had too many incidences yet. I'm sure there's cheating going on, right? I'm not so naive to think that there isn't. But we haven't had any sanctionable offenses that have taken place. And I say that, I was invited to be on this panel, and two weeks ago I had my very first cheating incident on an exam and uh, this is one that I had to write a report on, right? That was just a couple of weeks ago. In my five years of doing this on faculty, it was my first. Um, I want to underscore some of the things that were mentioned already, the idea of proctors. So we have graduate proctors and undergraduate proctors. We have 490 undergraduate TAs, bio 490 undergraduate TAs. Part of their duties, there's several that they have to uh, accomplish on a weekly basis and an hour of um, office hours, they are responsible for review sessions, they grade, and they also proctor exams. So this way, each of us instructors get about four to five undergraduate TAs proctoring exams. These are also the same TAs that are there every lecture. 
So when they're there for every lecture, they get to know these students well as well. And then on top of it, up until about two years ago, we had two graduate students proctoring. These are the same graduate students who are their lab TAs. We've just increased it to three now. And if you factor in the amount of class time these lab TAs, graduate TAs are spending, um, give them their grade and time and also their office hours, you can actually factor in two to three proctoring sessions and they still fall into that 20 hours a week category. So there really is, um, we don't have any buy-in issues with graduate TAs proctoring during exams as well. Something else that Paul mentioned was the software. We do the same thing. I love it. It not only scrambles all the questions between different forms, but it also scrambles every question and their responses within each question as well. That works beautifully. And I always, always, always have full forms and make sure that they're distributed. They have different colored booklets. He may have his symbols, I just simply photocopy them on different colored, colored paper. And once they're handed out, I also get all my proctors. There's nine of them now in every exam. We're stumbling across each other during the, in the hallways. But I always make sure that they go through and check that students are seated next, next to different colored forms. That's important because once students face one or two of these exams, they know there's no point in cheating. There's no point in even looking over at another exam booklet or Scantron because it's completely scrambled. So I think that's about what I need to say at that point. Is there any other questions that you have? What is the software that you mentioned? So I use Wamba. Is that what you're using? Uh, ours is just the Pearson. Our textbook is. A I think it's the same textbook. thing. Yeah. Yes. So. so I, it's a it's a clunky thing. It lives on the instructor website. Right. I, I mean, I never have a lot of faith it's going to still be there next year or yeah. with the next upgrade. But they've limped it along. And so the same, it's the identical piece of software that I'm using. It came with our cell and molecular biology textbook by Pearson as well. I bet there's a version. Or an equivalent type of yeah. software for scrambling. There's, a, there's some equivalent thing. Okay. It's a good thing for me to look into, and I'm looking at Cindy, who can help me. Um, I'd like to have something like that generally available, regardless be of great. what you were using. Yeah, so let me, let me look into that. Are these multiple choice tests? So in our case, for Bio 115, which is the very first biology class they're taking, it's all multiple choice matching, but it's all Scantron, bubble in type of exams. Does the eCampus do that? I mean, we use Soul at the Health Science Center, which scrambles every mm -hmm. question. So the test, the questions are scrambled and all the answers. And I, eCampus, I thought, was the down. But then how do you download it? Huh? How do you download it from there? I mean, we could, we could use eCampus. Right. The, it's your the issue with eCampus for us is that we can't do 300 simultaneous right. secure ah, exams. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I see. So we want saying. them all in front of us, and then we want all the exams to end at 8.30 or whatever. So... Right. For us, it's a piece of paper. Yeah. I know what you mean, and we were trying. We actually did that with pre and post tests for part of our assessments that we do in in biology. And when you have sixteen hundred students that you have to put through a computer lab to have access to those, that's I mean, that's that was difficult. Yeah. So we tried it. <laughs> we tried it. We tried we're, it for a couple of years, and it just didn't. Ours work. is a small, large group. It's really chemistry and math that and biology that have the large, large groups. So do you? So so your your exam is one color, and you have a matching color on the scantron, correct? So therein comes the 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 sanction that I just had to place a couple of weeks ago. Right. We always provided our own scantrons in biology. Yeah. Up until budget cuts and everything else came into place, and we had to now incur the cost on the student, they bring in their own scantrons. And this is where I came into this issue, where a student had written material on the back of the scantron. So now we need to find a solution, right? We absolutely need to find a solution because we can't. I'm giving a student at the opportunity now, or all these students, the opportunity to write on something because they're bringing a paper that we've asked them to bring into their exams. 
So my question was, the temperature we used to have, the exam was one color, the Scantron was color-coded to match right. it, right? And we had a student, <laughs> you're smart, <coughs> we had a student who, as the student came in, somehow picked up maybe a yellow Scantron. Amazing. And then when they, they kind of did that Scantron, and then when they went to the desk, they sat at a blue desk, which was next to a yellow. Right. So as they were filling out the Shut Scantron, up. It was the yellow scan. Incredible. Right? And they, yeah, they were yeah. next to the yellow person. So I was curious. So now, right. once we knew, we really did right. that, when they brought up their exam to hand it in, we would check what's the color on your scan, and what's the color on your exam. Is yeah. it the same color? Mm -hmm. If it's not, you're screwed. I understand. We don't have that because in our case, you just bubble in form A, form B, form C, or form okay. D. That's all you have, the four okay. options for each Scantron, which is, which is trouble. So now what I'm trying to do is work with our Scantron vendor to try and have a custom customizable Scantron, which we can actually just attach to the back of the booklet. Yeah. That's obviously going to cost more money, but it, on the long run, it may be cheaper for our department than purchasing Scantron forms, which is 10 right. cents a piece or something like we that. We in, in physics... Uh, our 112 instructor is testing a system that is based on the PDF scanner that's built into the photocopier. Mm. So it's avoiding the Scantron form copyright, and you could put it on the back. Assume, well, you would, I don't know if you'd want to staple it into the back, but basically they would turn in their, their sheet, and this thing would run through the scanner, and, and then it would be scored however you want. Do you know the cost of that software? Uh, the, the cost, as I understand it, is relatively, well, I mean, it's on the $1,500 okay. sort of range. I mean, it's That's affordable reasonable. for departments. Uh, what we're trying to figure out is, does it work? Because uh, right now, our, our, we do a lot of Scantron for pre- and post-testing content knowledge for the physics education research, and we are using the hand-me-down chemistry thing that used to live in the chemistry research lab. I mean, <laughs> our Scantron is limping along waiting to, to fail. So we're looking actively for a way around that that doesn't involve sending $1,000 to Scantron every now and then. And that's part of the problem, too, is that you mentioned the idea of not stapling because that little staple tear is what also causes problems with feeding into a machine. That's right. Clunky. I mean, I would think just having the students bring in their own Scantron is going to increase the wrinkly, messed up Scantron rates <laughs> a <laughs> lot yes. compared to handing them out. So, I have another question. How do you, you said something about training the, uh, the proctors. Mm -hmm. How, wh what kind of training are you providing? How are you training them? What are you, kind of what are you telling them? So there were two, actually. I did a session on academic policies and focused primarily on academic integrity. But essentially, um, that was my part, um, to let them know what academic integrity is, what the violations are, how the reporting process goes. Um, and then Eberly attached to that kind of a behavioral training. Mm -hmm. So, all right, if you see something and you're an undergraduate TA, your job is to talk to another TA to corroborate. Mm -hmm. If you're a graduate TA, you're fine on your own. If it's something egregious, you all are talking to your instructor. And it was kind of like, what is the chain of command and the flow of information in these, in these scenarios? So that if I'm an undergraduate TA in particular and I see a peer, I feel comfortable about how I'm going to proceed and I'm not inviting confrontation. Right. Um, because of the old standard of evidence, there was almost an implied right. confront, take something. We're like, no, don't, don't do that. Right. So it was a, it was a behavioral shift to just like, no. Again, now that there are multiple proctors, again, biology's got a lot. Physics and math were using mm -hmm. one. Corroborate. There's eight other bodies in the room. Walk up right. to somebody and be like, do you see? You know, again, and they can point to the photo roster. You see CX doing whatever the same thing. Oh yeah, I do. Good. Move yeah. on. That's all you need to do. So I used and to, I used to have a, a, I used to keep the whole front row. Mm -hmm. And then, because cause of all the, you know, it was so difficult to prosecute anything, and it was almost, why should I even go through it? Nothing yeah. can happen. So I used to keep the whole front row of seats empty, and then if I saw something that I felt was an issue, instead of confronting it, I would just take that student and move the student in front and just say, hey, can you please move, you know, and I just move them in front. Yep. No, we've, we've uh, I think I did with chem more than math. Math was too big to do it. We left the front row open for accommodations, so that's why you got an OAS accommodation, but then also for, mm -hmm. you couldn't tell exactly what was going on mm -hmm. or who was at fault. You can just move someone yeah, and diffuse the situation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, again, all those kinds of things we went through with the proctors and the TAs, right, right. and even the faculty who, were, who had questions, you know, right. do I have to grab a picture of something? Yeah, no, no, I'm getting good. I was worried, I gonna get in trouble for doing that because if, if the student ever complained, oh, she really interrupted my test time, blah, 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 and I was worried about that when I had just moved mm -hmm. the student, you know, but no one ever did complain. Mm -hmm. Without um, graduate proctors, yeah. we, just to add to what you said, we, we have 
a training session, a workshop, mm -hmm. every August before the semester even starts. And that's a part of the training there. Joy Carr last mm -hmm. year was going around giving this presentation mm -hmm. on academic integrity. And so I took a version of that, right, right. made some slight changes, and then that's what the graduate proctors have to go through. A part of their right. training is academic dishonesty and what to be aware of, mm -hmm. even when it comes to that plagiarism aspect, because that's our bigger issue. In biology, it's not the exam cheating, but it is the plagiarism on lab reports. That's what we really deal with. It's actually a very nice form. I had the misfortune of using it the other day. <laughs> and the form will probably be changing a little bit over the next year, but our, our goal as we change policy is to, to keep it very streamlined for faculty, make it, make it easier for faculty if we can, but just improve the process for, <coughs> for what happens to students who might be repeat offenders, that, that a faculty member wouldn't know that was the case, uh, things of that nature. And, yeah. and you said that like, you can report anything if they're mm -hmm. suspicious, mm -hmm. and then yeah. what, what happens with that? So you'll, so Academic Standards Resources has all this stuff. It is now officially Azaleas. Um, we built a reporting form in Adobe Sign. So the way this works is when you click that link for reporting, you fill out this information at the bottom, it'll say sign. When you apply your signature, that kicks it off automatically. It notifies her, she's collecting all that information, right? And then so that she can proceed on multiple offenses, enter into our database. We're starting to collect a lot of data. We did a big uh, data session on the 440 cases we had last year. So all you've got to do is fill this out. Um, I believe the, uh, the college gets a copy of it. Your mm -hmm. chair gets a copy of it as well. Yeah. I mean, my take on it is that it's more when you, you've you know, maybe discussed with a student or you have proof that an incident occurred and you've assigned some kind of sanction or given the student a warning. Um, if there's something that you have a question about, you can always call me and I, I can give uh, you or anyone my contact info. Um, you know, if, if there's something you're uncertain about, I'm happy to talk it through with you. Uh, but this is, this is really for when you have determined that something has happened, you've decided to, to let the student know that that you believe academic dishonesty occurred, and you've either given them a warning or some kind of sanction for their behavior. Now, the warning was I was going to pull out, yeah, mm -hmm. that you just talked about. I think, you know, even if you want to just hand out, like, hey, you left the exam, you came back, mm -hmm. you can't do that again, mm -hmm. right? There doesn't have to be a sanction, but at least then she would have that on record. No, mm -hmm. you talked to the student, you gave them a warning, you said, don't leave the exam and come back again. That way, if they do it again, <laughs> mm -hmm. right, you've got a record to be like, no, no, we talked about this, mm -hmm. right? Why are you doing this again? I would say, yeah, again, I would say err on the side of reporting, and again, you've got a no sanction warning option, and you could at least just document whatever it was you talked about. Okay, and I like the way that the, the language on Paul's exam here states, uh, if, your behavior, if your behavior during the exam or your exam is submitted suggests that your exam does not hold your own work, you'll receive a zero. So that covers that kind of thing. If, if they act in a way during the exam that you think suggests they might be cheating, that and under this exam, language is grounds for doing something, for making a report. Um, so you don't have to have a <coughs> that they cheated. You can just give them a warning for acting in a way they shouldn't have done during the exam. And on my cover, I have a statement about how students should not leave the examination on this unless they're completely done. Um, and of course, the exception is a student that has accessibility mm -hmm. um, services permission to do so. I can share that with you as well. This is just institutional. So and you could err on the side of, I saw you do a weird hand gesture. Mm -hmm. We've I, seen a I couple of them. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I would say to do so, because again, part of what we have seen actually is a student who seemed to be communicating with another student, this was last year, um, seemed to be communicating with students during tests, and they got warned. 
And then they did it again. And they're like, all right, I'm gonna give you a hit on this assignment. And then they did it a third time, and it's like, all right, come on, man. And but if if you had waited to the third time, right. you know, as they get appealed that, we don't have record of the first two. It's a different critter. If we've got the warning and then the other way, and then, like, well, no, look, you've been talked to three times. Like this is a closed case. Um, Particularly when you want to have sanctions that stick, my my suggestion is to err on on reporting. You know, Azalea's office is handling appeals and those kinds of things. They'll shake out. Like the ones that don't stick will go away. These don't get reported to anybody. Um, no one sees them outside of you know the appropriate offices. So, but they would be there if there was a case, right? Yeah, that's if there exactly. was a case, then you have the whole track record. That's right. Yeah. And, and the other behavior. That's right. Mm -hmm. The other issue that would arise is if. You see suspicious hand gestures and you don't report it, and you see it and you see it, and none of you, well, you know, you finally report it. Yeah. I have no idea that they've also seen right. this, so I think it's a one off. But if you, you report bet. it and then you report That's it important. and then you report it, I'm going to be having a very serious conversation like with So, do kids. I have access to who has submitted one of these reports for one particular student, for example? Um, Will I, as a faculty member, do I have yeah. access to that information? Because no. that would probably decide on what my sanction is going yeah. to be That's on why we don't want well. you to have it. Right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. My, my goal, Lou's goal, we, we want you to focus on the incident in front of you. Sure. And sanction I get it appropriately. That's fair. And I can deal with That's completely fair. Yeah, we don't, and we were just talking about this, we, had, we don't have a good institutional policy right now on repeat offenders. And one mm -hmm. of the major policy changes is to, is to say, all right, well, when we have information now that is repeat offenses, this is how it's handled. So that way, as a faculty member, you're not worried about the repeat offenses. They're going to get covered. Right. The institution is covering those. Your job is, this case in my course right in front of me is this, and right. I want to handle it this way. Uh, and then someone else will say, all right, now we're sweeping up those who have done this now three and four times. We got them covered. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, if you do do a sanction, does that um, mean that you have to report it to the institution when they graduate? Like, well, Suspension or expulsion of what? So any of the, yeah, the I had the to cheat on a homework assignment, and I, would, I just gave them a zero for the assignment, so I would write that, that, that I would mark that, and that would yeah. not follow them forever. Nope. Correct. Okay. UFs go on transcripts, and UFs are, are almost universal markers of you got failed for academic dishonesty. So if you unforgivable if you, F is what yeah, it's unforgivable F. Yeah. So if you sign one of those, that is telling everyone who will see that transcript why they got that F. Probation and expulsion are tied to reasons, and that goes on a transcript. But again, typically those aren't assigned by faculty. The UF is. Probation and expulsion come out elsewhere. Suspension and expulsion come out elsewhere. So the, really the only one as a faculty member you have to worry about in terms of following a student is the UF. And a, a, a department chair, a dean, or whoever overturn a UF given by a faculty member? They can. Well, they have to they have to approve it, and right now appeals, the way the current appeal structure works, and this is current, so it is this year, appeals can decrease the severity of a sanction. They cannot increase the severity of sanction. So if you say UF, they could decrease that to an F in the course. They could decrease that to something else if they felt uh, that was justifiable. They couldn't take your UF and say, no, we're expelling you. Right? So, um, but can a dean aggravate a sanction? No. That process can. Mm -hmm. If it's a particularly, in addition to the repeat offenders, one of the things we're working into policy is how to uh, determine if an offense is particularly aggravated and deserves to be escalated for probation, suspension, expulsion, something like that. You know, so if a student steals an exam from a faculty member's office, yes, that was academic dishonesty, but it's a particularly mm -hmm. egregious behavior that needs to be looked at a, a little more closely. And that has <laughs> happened. Yeah. Well. Okay. Math, math had numbers of that. Yeah, people going through roofs, and breaking yeah. into offices, compromised keys to the building. Yeah, it's been exciting. It's been exciting. <laughs> you have a question? Well, I don't have a question. Never mind. Sorry, I don't have a question. I have a comment, and I, if it's good, it's taking us off of this. So if you still have a question no. about this, you should feel free. No, I have a question about something else. Oh, okay. Well, I just wanted to. I um, a lot of these things you guys kept talking about kept making me think about this software that I'm using right now, and I just wanted to briefly advertise it. Um, it costs money, so you have to figure that out. But um, it's called CrowdMark. So Crowd, like a group of people, and Mark, because it's Canadian, so they say marking instead of grading. Yeah. But um, it, it, it's hard to explain it really briefly. You can go to their website. They have a nice little video you can watch that sort of explains it. And if you're interested, you can contact them, and then they'll um, do like a webinar with you and kind of show you how it works. So it's called CrowdMark. And basically what you do is you're creating an exam um, that has it 
If you have 50 students, it will create 50 versions of the test with a unique QR code on it. <laughs> so when you pass the exam out, the student writes their name on the test, and then after you have given the exam, you collect it back up and you scan it into your system, and then the crowd mark will match the QR code to the person's name. And so it can do it automatically. We've had some trouble. They're still in beta testing, so the automatic matching's not always working, but you can, I mean, I haven't had any trouble, but somebody else had, like, two students with the same last name get switched or whatever. So we, you can do it manually, so. How are you scanning it? You just scan it with your regular copy machine. Really? Yeah. Okay. That's amazing. And it creates a PDF, and you upload the PDF, and then Freaking what it does, out. and also, like, you mark, here's where question one is, here's where question two is, so before you give it, you mark, put all that in the system. And then what that allows us to do is, one, our graders can grade from anywhere at any time. Um, so you're grading question one, you don't have to be in the building, you grade it through the software. Um, and when you're done, it totals all the points up for you, so you don't have to spend any time doing that. Um, and you have a, a record forever of the exam because it's there, uh -huh. so there's never a chance of a student changing an answer afterwards or you know altering it. Um, and when you're done grading, you just hit send, and it just sends an electronic copy of their exam. What? The comments, there's a comment library, so if you have, this is my favorite thing about it, if you need to give this, like, say this common mistake keeps happening, so you write the comment one time, and then it, it just automatically yeah. populates in the library, you just drag it every time you see that same mistake, you can assign point values to that, so like you can make that comment worth four points, and whenever you drag it over there, it automatically gives them four points. Now you're mentioning short answer type of questions. Can you do multiple choice, they like have bubble in as well? Option too, and I, have, I don't use that, but they have a multiple choice thing, and they even have something that might automatically grade the multiple choice. I'm not positive about that, so you need to like you'd have to research that. But to date, Cindy. I love it. I can't imagine thinking <laughs> any other way at this point, actually. And I'm even just using it myself. And then people that have graders, it's really nice. Like somebody's trying it; they're going to give a test before Thanksgiving break, and then their graders could be working on that. Over Thanksgiving break <laughs> from wherever. Um, I, I like love it. it. And I think it helps a little bit with the academic honesty stuff too because you have the record of the test. Yeah. I have all my paper exam, but the students also have a copy and you don't have to. Like There's to. logistical yeah. challenges to some extent. Like I don't staple the test. That's, I heard some of you talking about that. I don't staple them. But you, there's just three pages. There's a nice cover page, so it's really clear to see. Like You don't staple them because you have to scan individual scan pages. Individual. But I just hand them three pages, three pages. You can do multiple versions. That could be a nightmare. Effort. Anyway, I think it's worth looking into. I'm trying to yeah. be quick about it. There's, I never so get lots of questions look. about how it works, and, but they've pretty much ironed out most of the difficulties. And you can integrate it with Blackboard. We haven't done that yet because Blackboard, mm. we're just trying it right now, and eCampus wouldn't do the... They have to approve it or whatever, and they wouldn't do it until we committed to buying it, so we can't do it that way. We still have to do some things manually. But I think with the Blackboard integration, it would be really even better. So so was thanks for sharing. Any FERPA issues with something like that? Because you've got an outside company now having access to your students' work slash free. ITS would, would would investigate it for what's security, right. yeah. No, so they if we went enterprise, that would be something they would have to answer for. Yeah, we don't get the security scan. Yeah. yeah. If there is issues, then we um, bounce back to the vendor to fix those mm -hmm. the issues. So it is something that's... Yeah, that's what you... I mean, I'm, yeah, I, <laughs> that's a really good point. If it's already got Blackboard integration, somebody's probably fought that battle already somewhere. Site license. And if we can just turn it out in other platforms like that, the FERPA issue right. would be right. the same. Right. Yeah. yeah, because turning it in is a different vendor. Yeah. 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 yeah third party vendors don't have necessarily FERPA violations, just making sure they have the security protocol mm -hmm. to that doesn't have that problem. So you had mentioned with your seating charts, you um, assign the students, and we also in pharmacy use a seating chart, mm -hmm. but they just randomly get their number as they walk into the room. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Do you have a computer system that does it? Is there it a generates the photo roster? Or they, they somehow attach the, the student name with a seat number and something they're either handing And the left hand, name. right hand so is an important factor too. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on making it better because it was me. <laughs> I was the computer <laughs> system. Um, based on what the instructor or course wanted, I just took the, the, the relevant bucket of students and all the information I needed, threw it into an Excel file, randomized it by student ID, and then dumped that into the seats that, they were, that I wanted. I had extracted left hands, I left front seats open, so I then would just literally find the rows that I wanted and dump them in there. Um, the photo roster is a separate process, and then Tommy, Tammy Stallnacker has 
IDs. She, she has all the photo IDs connected to student IDs. So once I've got the roster drawn, I hand her the roster, she runs the IDs, and it can generate the photo roster that says, well, if these are the ID orders, this is the photo order. Um, I'm trying to build a website over December that will walk people through doing exactly what I did. It's not hard. It is kind of making sure it's clean because it is mostly just manually manipulating stuff right now. We don't have a good program for doing it. Paul, how did you find out who was left-handed and right-handed? Uh, how, how did I find out who was left-handed? I sent them a Google form that said, are you left-handed? <laughs> <laughs> and then they, I mean, it, yeah, it helps a lot. We, ha we also had some conflict with chemistry. We had accommodations. We had left-handed yeah. people. We have music rehearsal people. Uh, so each of these yeah. categories of exceptions was listed by physics number. And, you know, I, I did... I, I chose not to use uh, the, the college version of that, so, but I essentially did the same thing. I took a giant list of students. I walked through the rooms and said, I want to use these seats. Uh, I want to not use these seats so that, you know, I, I chose to use it so that there were uh, basically rows of, of empty seats and, you know, mm -hmm. columns of empty seats in between rows of occupied seats or whatever. Uh, and, you know, you, it's, it's tedious. Uh, the first time through, especially mm -hmm. when you're figuring out, oh, I got to do this, oh, I got to do that. This kid doesn't need a seat because this kid's doing this or going to the ex you know other room for the interpreter or whatever. Uh, but but it may be a worthwhile investment for your group of students because you're seeing them every year for four years, correct? So you yeah, can have that. It just occurred to me what we could do. We do all electronic exams mm -hmm. via Sol, so okay. we could probably just embed a question that says, "What seat are you sitting in?" And then if you suspect someone, because my issue, our, our class is smaller, but I still don't know every student by name, but I would remember the seat. So if I could go back and say, okay, it was this seat, <coughs> and it's G7, and if I ask that question on the exam, that might be a way to get around it. What we do is we have specific seats where we've targeted, you can't have them at this mm -hmm. angle, and we have them on stickers, and then we mass produce the stickers. So then for faculty members, we just hand it to them, and then as the students walk in, they just, handed to the students. So there's none of the spreadsheet logistics that you okay. do in advance. It works really right. well, except you don't know the name of the student, of the student. sitting in the seat. And so that, that I may actually try that. Just make mm -hmm. that one of my test questions that you don't get points for. And then if it came up, you know where they were at. I would know where they yeah. were at. How do you have the photo roster easily available? It's on eCampus. You can just print a you can just print a PDF, you know whatever reference packet of them if you want. I, I, I there's know. been both. There's been a couple of the again it's been different by courses. There's been a couple courses that have printed the PDF file so it's on paper and if they need it they can flip to it and look at it. Uh, and there's been a couple where they've just provided tablets. There were tablets or some kind of light laptop and they had them walk around with those if they needed them. A lot of times the students, you know, it's their picture from the <laughs> 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 once you see them four years later, they actually look a lot Not different. They're Very like, true. So if you're just Very true. them for the third or fourth year, yeah. it, it would be nice to have them updated. I don't know if that's possible, but things can change a lot. IBS did push out where they could get the card at a discount um, price when they just recently changed. Uh, a lot of students took them up on that, uh -huh. and the way they they had to do a new photo to get that. Okay, card. okay. Yeah. It's contingent on getting the update on the ID. We yeah. just have we just have access to whatever their ID is on file. Right, right. That's right. all it is. Yeah. I have a question about this because there just seem to be so many students now that get so many different accommodations. And sometimes that foments <coughs> shitting, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you how I mean how do you have any best practices for that because now we have students who get time in half or double time and ooh, I need a quiet distraction free room and I need someone to read me the desk. It's almost overwhelming for an instructor who's already teaching 500 students and having to press with them and then oh I have 10 students who get all these accommodations and it's me. Yeah. So, well, now, well, there's a new director of, academic, or of accessibility services coming in uh, mm -hmm. being hired and I've that's one of the questions I've put to the first candidate and we'll put to the next two is that, you know, how and particularly for large courses, how do you how does this office going to help manage those accommodations? And I think right. what there hasn't been 
in, in the past has been good guidance from that office on how you manage that. Um, and even if it's not them helping, guidance would help, right? What can we do? How would Strategies. you do this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've been asking, um, that's going to be more for someone out of that office to tell you and help. Um, we can provide space. We can help do those kinds of things. But I would want someone in that per position to tell you what the best practices are. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually from that office. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and I will say, I don't think I have an answer for your question, but I will say that we are working on a testing center for students with accommodations. Mm -hmm. um, that would be great. That is hoping to be open by fall of like With proctors, so that, that, so that the instructor can just say, this student gets two hours, here's the exam. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the instructor's... Oh, that would be delightful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. It will nice. actually be in this library. It's actually going to be like over there. Will <laughs> be open past five? Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, so we're still working a lot of the ins and outs. Obviously, we are in the process of getting a new director, so a lot will hinder or will um, you know, hinge on that. But um, it is in the works. Um, faculty have been very uh -huh. I have been screaming at the top of my lungs for five years, so nice. I'm with you. Nice. <laughs> well, if there's no final questions, I gotta run. Just one of oh. the back two. Yeah, I'm sorry. No worries. Uh, the, the chem test done like large lecture style, right? And you have someone check the IDs as they come in. Do you encourage the students to come early to get their IDs and they go to their seats? How we didn't. We didn't. We sure wish we did. Check the IDs versus their face and say, here, take That could take a long time. How long does that what ran, yeah, what we ran into is that actually it was, it's about a 20 minute process and they've just been doing 20 minute shorter tests. Next year they're gonna, or next semester, I think they're asking uh, Dr. Dean Lastinger to give them a half an hour on the front end. So instead of a two hour test, it's a two and a half hour testing period with the first half hour being dedicated to, to logistics, to getting people in and setting down. Um, they ran into situations where they've been booked immediately after another exam. So they had exactly two hours and they just had to make do with the fact that the first 15, 20 minutes is getting them settled. Um, didn't, yeah, didn't, Again, <laughs> didn't anticipate all the logistical problems, but it takes a long time. Yeah, so we're going to ask for more time up front for that reason. But now I see another problem with that, which is half an hour that we have at NSO trying to figure out how these students are going to schedule. We just lost another half an hour in a day. Mm -hmm. right. uh, they're not, see, now as part of, part of it, each one has to handle it differently. Some of them want to have the test on the desk, and some of them want to have proctors distribute them. I want them seated and quiet and ready, and then distribute the test at the time the test will begin. Mm -hmm. But that's going to be up to departments to, to parse out how they want to handle that, too. Okay, I have a question. Uh, the photo rosters, whenever uh, multiple sections are testing at the exact same time, you can get a photo roster for that test? It's that room. It's, it's, that room. it's tied to the room. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we sent student ID numbers to Tammy, installing her. Numbers that are in that room. They've got to be tied to the room and the room diagram, but yeah. Cool. Yep. Sweet. Um, you had mentioned that you had a presentation and then Everly had its own presentation for training mm -hmm. undergraduate and graduate PAs. Is it possible to copy of those? Sure. Mm -hmm. Shoot email or? Yep, shoot me an email. I've got the academic, we, we share the academic integrity one with uh, Azalea, and then Joy Carr has the one they did for Everly itself. Uh, and I'll, she'll yeah, be I'll copy Joy that. and circle it back to her and get that for you. Yeah. That, that has the things on it, like have, make sure another TA sees it, yeah. the issue of moving students to a different seat, all yep. of that. Is in there. Mm -hmm. And I think it also has all the different types of cheating. See, I didn't realize there was something called contract cheating, where students share something like a clicker. But that's also sanction, sanctionable, and it's written in there as well. What about the bathroom break? Is that part of that yep. document? Yep. Yep. We debated that one for a long time. <laughs> Can't stop them from going to the bathroom. That doesn't mean you have to let them back in. <laughs> Is it possible that Amy sends it to everyone that's signed up for this? Uh, yeah, actually, let's just do that. Yeah, we'll collect all that stuff, send it to Amy, and Amy can shoot it out to the group. Thank you, all. thank you all for coming. Thank you very John much. John Paul, thank you. Yeah, thank you.